Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 21 of the Camino Voice. On this episode, I speak to the owner of Island Harvest Farms. Please welcome Rachel Pigott. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new podcast episode every Tuesday. Uh, on this episode, I'm speaking to Rachel Pigott, who owns Island Harvest Farms, which she started uh, about five years ago. And um, so we get into all things farming. And I, it was you know, a great interview talking to her about how she got into farming. Uh, we talk about whether or not that kind of ran in the family, um, where she got her experience, and um, kind of what she has going on with Island Harvest Farm and her journey to now getting the farm to the size that it is and what the future looks like. So anyways, please enjoy my conversation with Rachel Pigott. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Commando Voice. Today, I'm here with Rachel Pigott. <laughs> How are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Good. Thank you for having me. All right. So before we get started with everything, tell us a little bit about Rachel. Uh, where do I start? I grew up actually just on the other side of the freeway in Arlington. So I spent K through 12 in Arlington, and then I was a social worker, and then, well, kind of long story short, and I'm a farmer. <laughs> Okay, so you were you spent all of your like through high school in Arlington, yeah, yep. um, just going to the main high school or schools there. Yep, yep. Moved okay. there when I was like two, so I don't remember living anywhere else. Okay, cool. What? Um, so then, from high school, did you go to college? Yeah, I went to Western in okay. Bellingham, so I I got a degree there. Then I did the AmeriCorps for a year, and I ended up going to Boston to get a master's degree in social work. <laughs> okay. So, what was your initial degree in? Uh, human services, which okay. is a great program. I don't know if it's still happening up at Western, but I loved it. It was great. Okay. So then through AmeriCorps, then you went and got your master's. Mm -hmm. at, wh where in Boston? Uh, Boston University. Okay. At the time, um, social work positions were really wanting MSWs. They were trying to get more credentialed people, so it was really important to get it. And then by the time I graduated, it was not so important anymore, but I already had it, so. Okay, and then <clears throat> was that, like, did the AmeriCorps help pay for that, getting through that, or? A little bit. I think I got, like, $5,000, so I got okay. a little bit. Okay, nice. So then did, did you work in human service or social work very long? I did. I worked a couple jobs in Boston after I graduated and then decided that I'm really a West Coast person. <laughs> so I moved back home and I worked for the Office of the Family and Children's Ombudsman down outside of Seattle and Tukwila for like seven years, I think. So I was there for quite a while. Seven years. Okay. Yeah, it was... It was a public policy job, so part of how I got into farming, I'm sure we'll get into it, but I came home and I would weed in my yard after work just so I could see that I'd made a difference somewhere because policy is such glacial <laughs> change that happens. It wasn't the greatest fit for me, but it was a good job for seven years. Yeah. So when you were over in Boston then, what, what type of social work were you doing over there? I worked, well, I have a dual master's in social work and education, so I was working in adult education, and it's called the Boston Center for Adult Education, so it's like non-credit, just kind of for fun, pottery, cooking, sewing, kind of, we had like 30 different categories, so all sorts of classes that you could take for fun. Okay, and then did you help teach those, or? No, I coordinated, <clears throat> I coordinated the teachers, so I had, there were three of us, so I had a third of the programming I was in charge of getting the instructors and getting it all written up for the course catalog and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, yeah. So you were, how long were you over there again? I was only in Boston for about three years. Okay. So. How was it living on the East Coast? It was different. I, I mean, my great grandparents are from here and probably beyond that, I'm like from Washington. <laughs> so it was really different. I think it was a really good experience for me to kind of live somewhere else for a little while and 
Boston is a city, so I experienced city life. <laughs> and so, yeah, but in the end, I really mm-hmm. missed it back here, and so I came home. Yeah. Yeah, we spent um, uh, eight months living in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, okay. And thankfully, so I was doing a contract job for one of the companies I used to work with, and we were over at the Boeing site. Yeah. And so we were there, got there in, like, October and left in, like, May. Um, so it worked out well because we were there during the winter time. So to us, it was summer. It was great. We went to the beach. No one was there. Um, but the day we left was, like, 100% humidity and, like, Ugh. starting to hit the, like, high 80s. Which I'm sure anyone that's over from the West Coast is, or East Coast is laughing at me because we're like, it gets worse. But <laughs> for us, that was terrible. We're uh, like, nope, it's time to go. <laughs> the humidity was horrible. I remember I moved over there on September 1st, and I'd only ever heard about snow in Boston. Mm-hmm. No, I, like, I had no idea it was going to be humid. And I got there with like sweaters and sweatshirts, and it was horrible. It was so hot, and it was so humid, and I'd mailed all of my warm weather clothes <laughs> to like wait for them to get there. But... Yeah, the humidity was way too much for me. Yeah, well, that was the other thing is I got there in October, so it's fairly late in the year. It was still fairly humid, and it was probably like mid-70s or something. But with high enough humidity, I was like dying in between buildings at at Boeing, and everyone that was working around me was like, you missed the summer. It was 100% (laughs) humidity, like 105 degrees out. And that's what we had to just go through. I'm like, this is still hot for me. I'm from Washington. (laughs) Well, yeah, and Boston's even north. Some of the people I went to school with were like, this isn't even humid. They were from more southern. It was like, ugh, going home. Yeah, well, it's just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was, like, I loved, liked it during winter. It was great because it wasn't, it was nice and warm for us, and kids got to play outside and everything, but I couldn't be there during summer. That would be miserable. <laughs> it was miserable. <laughs> so, Yeah. Oh, and the other thing about the East Coast is I just, their seafood just is not as good as West Coast. It's not. <laughs> Crab is way better than lobster. Now yes. I'm on the record. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we were over there and uh, we would hear about these great restaurants, seafood restaurants. We'd go there and I'd always leave disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So then you move, you were over here and you, so you, when you say you were doing like policy work um, in Tukwila, what does, explain that a little more. We were the ombudsman's office. We were essentially oversight over the child welfare system for the state. Um, So as an ombudsman, ombudsmen are not advocates by definition. So we were kind of a third party when people had complaints. We would take a look at the situation and then make our own decisions based on what we thought was the correct policy and action and all that stuff. So got it. a lot of sad stories. (laughs) I'm a little too sensitive for that type of work, it turns out. So yeah. Yeah. So you did, but you did that for seven years. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I started as like more of an admin assistant. Mm -hmm. So I kind of kept getting promoted and eventually I ran the databases there for a while and then I became an actual ombudsman. So I just kind of kept getting promoted and with more money than I was going to make elsewhere. And I kind of, it came to a point where I knew I was going to leave, but I didn't know where. So I figured I might as well save money. (laughs) And then (laughs) when when the time came, I just quit. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, I've had a few people, um, I mean on the podcast, but just talking to people that have been in that, you know, in social work and stuff. And it's just, it's very taxing. Yeah. It's Um, extremely taxing. So, yeah. Um, in fact, I mean the gal, the podcast that was released, released this last week was, um, from CASA. No, not CASA. I'm going to get in trouble there. (laughs) Noah. (laughs) Um, sorry about that. Um, anyways, um, but she was saying like she got, you know, fatigue, um, emotional fatigue from dealing with animals. Yeah. And that too. And so, um, yeah, any of those things, it's definitely something that you need to be, it's a special type of person that can handle yes. that work. Yes. I know. I felt really bad leaving it. It's like, there's so much <clears throat> need, but I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so you left there and then, um, did you go straight into farming from there, or what was that? No, point? it was kind of like a big snowball. I started, I was living in Ballard, so my dad came down and helped me start my first little Ballard garden in my backyard, and I had chickens, and and then the Seattle Tilth is a great organization down there, and they just offer great, like, three-hour classes on gardening. Mm-hmm. So I took a lot of those and was all excited about it, and then I decided, having no 
biology background. It's all social science. I didn't take any of those classes. I just wanted to take botany 101 out of pure personal interest. So I ended up at Edmonds Community College. And it turns out, I didn't know this, but their horticulture program is excellent. So once I took one class, I just, I ended up taking, I think I have 45 credits there. I, <laughs> I, could, I just couldn't stop taking their classes. So I didn't actually graduate with a certificate from them, but I took all the classes I, I wanted. And it was, a lot of it was plant ID. You just wander around beautiful places and talk about the plants. It was so much fun. <laughs> so I kind of, at that point, I don't even know how, I ended up leaving the state and I got a job with a residential landscaping company in Seattle, which was great because I was then outside and I was no longer at a desk and I was working with plants, but it didn't really feel like what I wanted to be doing forever. Basically, it was like weeding and putting down mulch <laughs> and moving to the next house. So I randomly came across this internship out on Vashon Island at a small farm called Hogsback. And they're not there anymore, but I just kind of on a whim took the internship, but I moved out there. They housed us, so I had a little cabin, and I worked on the farm full time and right side by side with the farm manager, and that's where I got most of my learning. And then from there, I decided I wanted to try working on a little bit larger farm, so I ended up up at Cloud Mountain outside Bellingham, okay, towards Mount Baker, um, and I was there. F they didn't house us, so I didn't live on the farm, but I worked there full time for a season. And then at the end of that season, it was kind of like, so the pattern I'm sensing with this farm work is that every about September, I'm about to be homeless and unemployed. <laughs> like, I just, my personality is just, that's not how I want to live. So I kind of took a long time, but I finally decided, well, maybe I should try just doing it myself. So that's kind of how I ended up here. I looked for farmland for a couple of years. I looked all over the place and Finally, the perfect place opened up on Kameno. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so is farming a background, like, is that in your family background? Has anyone been doing that in your history? Sort of. I grew up on, um, my parents had a Christmas tree farm in Arlington. So okay. they started that, you know, before I was able to work on the farm. But I worked on the Christmas tree farm all the way through childhood and into I'd come home on college, too, and I'd work there. And once I moved to Boston, they sold the farm. And w my brother and I were like, you can't sell the farm. And my dad was like, well, when are you going to come back and work on the farm? <laughs> he was <laughs> kind of getting tired doing all the work himself. So, <laughs> But they had the tree farm for probably around 20 years, I would think. So, you know, I drove tractors and worked on the trees. And my grandma grew up on kind of a farm. I don't think they ever sold anything, but it was back when everybody kind of farmed to feed themselves mm -hmm. down in North Seattle. So I come from a lot of gardeners. My dad, who works with me a lot, he learned to garden from his grandma. So it's been kind of fun to kind of con compare and contrast what I've learned in all of my training and experience and then what he was told growing up by his grandma. And a lot of it lines up and some of it doesn't. But <laughs> 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 Okay, so then you... <clears throat> So let's see, you had gone, uh, you'd been working with some other farms in the area mm -hmm. and then you purchased the land on Kamehameha? Yeah, land? yeah. Okay, so tell me about, how did you get started once, like, once the land was purchased, what happened next? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a blur, I don't even know if I remember, but um, my dad's been helping me since the very beginning. He is, had kind of has like a building and sort of construction background. So he has a lot of skills that were mm -hmm. necessary for getting the infrastructure up and running. Well, and real quick, when, when did you actually purchase the land? Like what year was that? I think it was 20, it must have been August 2014. So I think 2015 was when I opened. Okay. So yeah, it's five years. Because in August, it was five years since I bought it. So, and it was horse. It had been horse farm for I think decades wow okay so we mainly we had to take down a lot of fencing we took down a lot of horse infrastructure and we had we put an eight foot fence around most of it for the deer to keep them out <laughs> that was a huge project <laughs> and yeah we just kind of got I had put up a hoop house right away since I got it in August, I was able to, we rented a tractor and kind of opened up the land and got some cover crop in so that at least 
be a little bit of nutrients going in the ground before I started in the spring, but Mm -hmm. it was a lot. It felt like it was overwhelming. It was a lot of decision making and I felt like I didn't have enough variables to like make good decisions, but we made the decisions and I'm kind of fixing some of those early decisions (laughs) now as we go, (laughs) but it's a learning experience. It's all kind of an experiment. Yeah. So then, so you got August, so then like you got those ground covers, but then are you kind of just waiting through winter at that point? Yeah, you order seed catalogs, they've moved it up. They're going to start coming in a couple of weeks now. Okay. So you order all your seeds in the winter. But yeah, I just kind of planned and I took, my farm is kind of patterned after Hogsback where I worked on Fashion. So I had taken really good notes for that from that experience. So I was kind of just going off of, what I had done there and just kind of hoping for the best, basically. <laughs> well, how, how did that, um, how did they run their farm different than like some of the other ones you worked at then? Um, well, they were, cause they had the farm stand. So, and they did the market. So I, I really loved the farm stand mm-hmm. idea from working there. Cause I really preferred, I wanted to be a farmer that kind of fed my community, my neighbors more than somebody who farmed and then took it all really far away and sold it to someone else. Yep. So, the farm stand was really what I was always looking to have kind of as the center of my business. And that definitely came from them. Um, but yeah, they, I just, the main difference, I guess, is they used to walk out their paths when, when you build your beds. And that was, the ground is so rocky here that <laughs> now I have a very lovely neighbor has loaned me his bed shaper. So now I have a tractor implement to help shape the beds, but. <laughs> Very cool. So then, so you got started, you got your first, you know, got everything ordered and everything. So what's your first spring? How did that go? I don't know if I remember. <laughs> there were a lot of tears. My poor dad, I was always like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. But we just kind of had to take it one step at a time. I was like, well, I know that I start seeds and flats and I know about, I'd written a plan. So I have a, every year I write a plan. So I know what I'm seeding what weeks. I just kind of was like, well, we put seeds in flats and we water them. And when they get big enough, we transplant them and then we water them <laughs> and then we harvest them and we hope people come and buy them. So <laughs> it's one step at a time. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when you got the land and then like getting everything to get started, did you have any capital starting with or just your savings? Yeah. Cause, well, I owned a house in Ballard. Okay. So I sold that. So I did, cause the big thing now is most young and beginning farmers don't have capital for land, but I did have capital to buy land and a little bit to get started. Too. Okay. So yeah, well, I mean, that is something I've heard a lot is like, um, getting into farming is so yeah. You know, cost prohibitive. It is. Um, and then it's a <laughs> lot of work. It is a lot of work. <laughs> There's no coasting and farming. So. No. <laughs> so what was your first round of crops in that first year then? Probably the first thing we usually put in is peas. And we still laugh about it because the farms I worked in, I'd never helped with the seed order. And so I'd really only ever ordered seeds for my 10 by 10 backyard garden. So like I put in these peas, which I thought was like this great, huge quantity. And it turned out to be like 25 feet of peas. And we're looking at it like, that's going to feed like us. Like, (laughs) oh man. Like, so it took a while to get to understand scale and Mm -hmm. what, how many seeds to order. But so peas are always first and lettuce, kind of the early spring crops you can get in get them going. And a lot of brassicas, which is, you know, the broccoli and the cabbage, those go in in the spring, then they take a while before they're ready to actually harvest. So. Okay. So then uh, on your first, your first year, then you had a lot of like, not quite enough on your produce and everything. Yes. And we even, you know, cause I think I had my spring seeding plan, like really dialed in. And then we were so busy that if you don't seed flats, then in a in a month or two, you don't have anything. And remember dad and I standing around in August, like, where's the food? <laughs> like we harvested it all. We got market next week. And oh, no. so it's taken, it's farming. I always, it's not rocket science, but somebody has to tell you how to do it. And it takes a lot of learning by experience. But every time you learn something, you can't apply it till the following year, a lot of the time. So the learning curve in farming is like really, really long. But <laughs> <laughs> It's not steep. It's just a very long. It's climb. long, and I don't think you ever actually get to where you know it all. So, but that's part of the fun of it. It's a constant challenge, and there's always more to learn. And 
So you never get bored. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> did that was it that first year you were able to start going to farmer's markets and stuff? Yeah, I did the Stanwood Market my very first year. I must have done the Camino, too. I must have done both of them. Okay. So, yeah, back when it was on Monday. So I did Camino yeah. and Stanwood. Okay. Um, so then you were doing the farmer's market. Then each year has, have you, is there like a certain growth amount you're looking for each year? Like I want to do X amount percent more or how do you kind of plan the next year? Yeah, a little bit. And I, I you know, I'm kind of, I've learned over the past few years what sells well and what doesn't here. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of starting to tailor things that are selling well. We definitely plant more of those things and things that aren't selling well, like kind of dial back a little bit, but yeah, I hope to grow a little bit every year I'm kind of to the I've hit kind of a ceiling of how much I can get done with my current crew that I have mm -hmm. so I'm not ready to get so big that I'm a people manager I still want to do the farming yeah but I'm probably gonna have to hire another person next year if anybody okay. <laughs> is looking for <laughs> harvesting help and weeding yeah how, but, how big is your team right now um, I, my dad's full time during the main part of the year. And then um, Mary Flippo, who I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. She's been volunteering since the very beginning. She's a good family friend. So she's around a couple days a week. And this year, my mom started a couple days a week because she had just retired. And then I have Michelle, who is my like actual real employee. <laughs> <laughs> she gets paid. <laughs> So then, so your dad was retired when he, you yeah. first started? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why he was able to just stay with it? Okay. Yeah, and he, I mean, the initial agreement was he was just going to help me get the farm up and running. And then the agreement was he was going to help me in the first year. But we actually, it's really fun. So we have such a great time together that I think at this point, he'll be around until he doesn't want to be anymore. So hopefully he'll be honest with me when he's ready to be done. <laughs> That's awesome, though. I mean, it's it's great to be able to, to to work one on you know work with your family and yeah, and everything. And that's, yeah, yeah. Well, and he owned his own very small business for thirty years, so he's also been a really great business mentor in addition to like the actual help and all of the skills he has and tools he has that I don't have. <laughs> but most of them migrated into my barn from his house at this point. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, you know, that was something with working here um, that I've gotten the chance to be able to work um, very closely with my dad yeah. and, and actually my brother-in-law, now sister. Um, not now sister, she's been my sister, <laughs> but my sister now works here more often. And, um, you know, that's been, it, it's been a neat aspect of yeah. it that um, yeah. you get to work with the people you love. So yeah, it's yeah. fun. Yeah, it's great. You kind of get to know them in a little bit different way too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you get to start seeing like, in a family dynamic, you see somewhat of how strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. kind of flow. But like in a business, you really can lean on those um, more strongly. Yeah. So that's cool. So then, <clears throat> so when did you actually open the produce stand? Um, right away. I Because I'd kind of come in advertising that I was open like May through October or November. And we had met a neighbor because a lot of people walk. I live on a loop. So there's lots oh, of okay. walkers. And we'd met a neighbor while we were building the deer fence. And we ended up talking to her every day because she walked by every day. She's so sweet. And so we told her we were opening in May. And she came by. It was like April 30th. We were spreading gravel to kind of make the little parking area by mm -hmm. the farm stand and make the driveway nicer. She was like, tomorrow's May 1st. You opening? And we were like, oh. So I think we <laughs> opened the farm stand with like two bags of radishes. And that was all that was in there. <laughs> So, but it was like, it was just so scary to actually like put it, anything out there. So it started very slowly and it's kind of like gotten bigger from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then did the, the other farm that you were working on, um, on Bashan, is that the one, did they do, um, a, what is that called? Um, trust based or honesty based um, yeah. style? Yep. Yep. And they did the credit program that I do as well. Okay. They were doing that too. Yeah, for our listeners who don't know, can you explain your credit program? Yeah, it's essentially a lot of people have asked if I'm going to do a CSA, and it's kind of my version of the CSA. And so I don't pack boxes, but I have a binder in there, so people prepay, and then they get they can just kind of keep track of it. They get you get your own sheet with your name on it. You keep track of your purchases, and you can put in more money when you run out. And some people give me ten dollars or twenty dollars at a time, and some people write bigger checks for a couple hundred dollars. Just depends on 
what works for you, but that way you don't need to have exact change or cash mm -hmm. or checks or it makes it a lot easier for some people. Yeah. Well, and I know for us it makes it easier because a lot of times we'll, what we'll do is we'll do one of the big checks and then we'll wait. And then, um, you know, my wife will text me when I'm at work and say, hey, can you swing by and pick up lettuce and, you know, stuff for tonight? Yeah. Um, and it works out really well. So, yeah. Yeah. We really enjoyed that. Um, how did you get in touch or connected with Mike Nestor and end up getting his Caesar dressing in there? He, he is actually my parents' neighbor. Okay. And so they met him because my dad really believes in talking to neighbors when mm -hmm. looking at houses. So mm -hmm. they were standing on the deck of that, <laughs> their house and they see Mike. And my dad was like, excuse me, do you know anything about this house? And Mike was like, well, I helped build it. And I'm a real <laughs> estate agent. Would you like to look inside? <laughs> So that's how I know Mike. Oh, that's funny. And, it's, and, you know, it's good that Mike didn't scare them away yeah. from being a <laughs> <Yeah>. neighbor. <laughs> oh, so then, um, very cool. So then just through conversation, we're able to, he was asked if he, you wanted to carry it. Yeah. I don't even remember exactly how it came about. Yeah. But yeah, the dressing is, it's, it's really good. So yeah. People miss it when it's not out there. Because yeah. he always, I know, wants me to have like romaine heads. Some, we try to wait for me to have romaine heads, but I'm always mowing them down for the lettuce mix. I know it takes me a while to actually have heads that I'm ready to sell. But. Yeah. Um, so then, <clears throat> let's see. So we've got the, you had dressing. And then, um, is the stand now open year round or is it still May through October ish? Sort of. I mean, I would like a little break during the year, so I don't fully want to be open 12 months of the year, but I want to be open as much of the year as possible. Um, so, and it really, it's a little weather dependent. This past year was so mild until we got all that snow, but um, I was harvesting a little bit in January and February. So, really? okay. so it was kind of one of those things where like the farm stand wasn't stocked, but I harvested like three, like once a week or something. So mm -hmm. if you hit it right on the day <laughs> I harvested, or I always post it on Instagram and Facebook. So okay. it's probably in the off season when I'm slower, that's probably the best way to figure out. And I try to hang the signs when I'm open, but I hope to be open again early this spring, but the weather, you just kind of never know. Yep. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. And then you've started doing these farm to table dinners um, talk about how you got started with that. Yeah. The chef Courtney, she's, her company's called Rainbow Eats and she, I think lived around the corner from me. And so I was shopping at the farm stand and she is a personal chef and caterer. Okay. So her dream has to always been to do farm to table dinners. So she tracked me down and was like, <laughs> let's do this. And I was kind of like, Oh, I don't know. So we kind of figured it out and we quietly did our first one in June. We just invited like friends and family because we had no idea how it was going to mm -hmm. go and we wanted people to be kind to us if it didn't go well <laughs> so and it did it was they've been really really great Courtney makes wonderful food and her goal is to serve food that people have either never eaten before or something that's prepared in a way they've never thought to prepare it mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting um, she gets chicken from a local guy over in Arlington it's all pasture raised chicken and a lot of produce from me and then some of the other farms in the area. And she, it's all, it's like a 100% local. She gets cheese from Samish Bay and she all here in most of her ingredients are local and she cooks it on the farm. And in the warmer months we eat outside and the last two have been inside in the barn because okay. we didn't know if it was going to rain. It was kind of cold at the last one, but <laughs> <laughs> we ate a lot of squash soup and made it through. <laughs> so nice. they've been, yeah, they've been really fun. That's very cool. Yeah, I saw pictures from the last one. Yeah. And we were we were going to try and make that just too many things going on, but um, my wife still keeps bugging me. So yeah. we'll, we'll be coming to one of them soon. Well, we're definitely doing them next year. And I think this year we kind of would do a dinner release a date because we just didn't know. But this year we're going to release all the dates in January or February so oh, okay. people can actually really plan ahead and know when they're going to be. So Nice. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, cool. Cool. Um, and then lastly, what do you see as the future of Island Harvest Farm? Man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I should probably have an end goal, but it kind of, I figure it's just going to kind of organically change as it's ready. I've, I've gotten bigger most years just because it's felt like I needed more space. So I don't, I don't really envision whether 
where it's going to, I just hope to just kind of keep growing produce for the community and I'll get bigger when it makes sense. And if it makes sense to get smaller, I can do that too. But kind of, I'm just going with the flow with it, I guess. So. Yeah. Do you have, are you kind of maxed out on your space or do you have a lot of land to keep growing into? No, I'm only growing on about <clears throat> three acres. So I, the, my whole place is a little under 10. So oh, wow. I okay. do have more space. And, you know, people have offered me space, too. <laughs> so if I needed to expand off the property, there's always other places to go on the island to grow food. So so I don't know. I mean, I, I, love, I love the farm. I love how it's going. So I'll just kind of, you know, and you never know what's going to go with the track. I feel like right now everybody's being told to eat vegetables and buy local. So I'm kind of riding that wave. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, well, and I, I feel like the Pacific Northwest has been on that that bandwagon for longer than yeah, most of the, the yeah, country. Yeah, so. yeah, the community has been, it's been amazing how welcoming they've been mm-hmm. and how excited they are to shop at the farm stand, which I'm so thankful for. I had nightmares, you know, before I got here of like having to just knock on doors and be like, I have vegetables down the road, like go buy them. <laughs> so it's been nice. The people have been very excited about it, so. That's Very great. cool. Actually, I had one more question. Um, do you have specific um, either um, mentor people you listen to, like maybe follow um, through other podcasts or books or that you kind of follow that, that you feel like you kind of base your philosophy off of as far as farming? Not one particular person. I'm kind of a nerd. So like I've read tons of books on small farming and there was there's a far- podcast called Farmer to Farmer that like, so much great information so I can listen to that while I'm working which is really great um but yeah I have all the books on there's a I think what's it called I think it's called growing for market gardeners or something there is a monthly publication that is written by farmers Mm -hmm. so it's really helpful um I do a lot of whenever I have questions about disease and pests or how to grow stuff I tend to stick with like WSU and OSU to kind of get the like high level agriculture information. But other than that, I just, that JM Fontier or however you say his name, he just spoke in Seattle. So I definitely have read his book and kind of read them all. And I just kind of take what makes sense for me Mm -hmm. and use it. And so, yeah, (laughs) kind of the farm is a a living thing. It's going to continue to evolve. (laughs) Well, very cool. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. Uh, so the first one is, do you have a lesser known or favorite location on Camino Island that you like to hang out? I do. I, I, in the winter, I spend a lot of time at the state parks walking and there, there's that Howard Adams trail that's at the Camino Island state park. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful. It's kind of in the trees and then along the bluffs, you get to look out over the water and that's one of my favorite spots to go walking. Nice. Um, pretend you have a friend coming from out of town. Uh, what would their first day look like here? Oh, man. I guess it depends on the weather. <laughs> 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 um, I'd usually take them to the state parks. Um, or we always come here because between the baked cafe and now tapped and the pastries, mm-hmm. like at some point you're hungry. So <laughs> definitely have to come here <laughs> and <Yep>. <laughs> eat something. Um, depend if they're, if I, they haven't been here, then they'll probably get a farm tour, but yeah, between there's always something outdoor to do mm-hmm. and eat food and hang out. Nice. Um, who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? Yeah, there's so many, but I think I'll go with my recency bias, but I just did a class out at Carla Matsky's sculpture park and okay. like. She, it's so fascinating what she's done out there. It's really great. So I'm sure she'd be a great interview. All right. And lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard on Camino Island, uh, right as you're driving on the island, what would it say? Uh, Probably eat more vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) That's good general advice. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Rachel for joining me on the podcast, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to stop by the Island Harvest Farm Stand. I know, I got you on that one. Be sure to stop by there, check out what she's got for sale there. Um, It changes, obviously, season to season, and uh, pick up some of Mike's Caesar dressing. So, uh, anyways, 
If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other pod, uh, islanders like yourself. And uh, for more information on this episode and previous episodes, go to kamenocommons.com slash podcast. That's kamenocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.